Hi, welcome to Design Reinvention Volume 3, Farm to Table Hotels by, uh, by Delivering Asia Communications and C9 Hotel Works. Um, this is the third in the series. We started a couple of weeks ago with Bensley uh, Human Zoo in China. We moved to health and wellness and today we're on the farm. I'm David Johnson. I'm the CEO of Delivering Asia Communications. Uh, just a few housekeeping points to start with. The session's going to be recorded, so you'll receive it afterwards, uh, about, about an hour afterwards. The session's going to last for about an hour. Um, and there's a Q&A function below your screen, so please ask questions as we go. Whatever pops into your, into your mind, whatever you want to ask, ask them as we go. We'll record them and, uh, and we'll ask them after the presentations. Okay, let's get going. So today's about food. Food's a serious business, a key demand generator for hotels. You know, we've seen post-COVID that buffets are increasingly of the past. Uh, the buzzwords are local, it's organic, it's artisanal. But to be honest with you, a lot of it comes down to common sense and creating a sustainable food supply line. So these are some of the issues that we're going to be talking about. Um, about how we can get farming going for hotels. So first up today is Jason Friedman. Jason has led farm to table offerings in Cambodia's Chintamani Wild, Rosewood Luang Prabang, Pu Chai Sai in Thailand, and he's on the upcoming UNESCO World Heritage Destination Focus Intercon in Khao Yai, Khao Yai Swan Lake Resort. Um, Jason, thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. Um, hello, uh, my name is Jason Friedman. Um, I have a small company called J.M. Friedman and Company. We specialize in developing and operating small luxury hotels around Southeast Asia. Um, I've had that company for a little over three years now. Um, and for the 23 years before that, I was um, operating small luxury hotels around Southeast Asia. Uh, and you can see there a few past projects. And as David said, I have a bunch of current projects here in the area. Um, I only have eight minutes, so I'm going to kind of go quickly here. Uh, today, I was going to talk a bit about Pu Chai Sai, uh, which is a property I look after up in the north of Thailand. I'll talk about a few other hotel farming projects, and then some of the things I've learned along the way. So hopefully, you can learn a few things for your hotel farms uh, from all the mistakes I've made over the last 25 years. So Pu Chai Sai is a 800-acre a natural estate um, at the base of Doi Tung up on the Thai Burmese border. Um, it was started by Mom Da. She's a Thai royal who got tired of society life in Bangkok a little over 20 years ago and she moved her life up to the up to the mountains. Um, built a beautiful bamboo, ho bamboo and mud hotel uh, that will be 20 years old this year. She's a rather accomplished designer, and she built this to allow Bangkokians to get away from the city, to experience uh, the rural country life up in, up in the hills. Um, we have 32 rooms, we have a meditation center, we have an organic farm and plantations. We have 26 kilometers of hiking trails along the property, uh, no televisions, um, and it's very much about the organic estate and being here in nature. Uh, the farms are a big part of what we do uh, at Puchai Sai. Um, you know, for the hotel itself, you know, our, our breakfast is fully supported by our farms. Um, all the vegetables we produce on the property, we use in our restaurant. Uh, we have 200 hens for our free range egg laying operations. And again, all those eggs are used in the hotel. Um, what's left get used in the staff canteen and sold at the market. Um, we have a substantial array of fish ponds. Um, we've tried growing yabbies in the past, Australian crayfish. Uh, we do a lot of honey harvesting uh, along the property. We have multiple fruit plantations. Uh, we have a tea plantation you can see there in the picture. And we also encourage a lot of foraging on the property um, by our Hill Tribe neighbors. Um, we also use our operation uh, to support a small mail order business. Uh, when we do have, you know, we had a great uh, mango plum season this year, and we'll put some notices out on social media 
and we'll get you know 100 or 200 people from around Thailand ordering our produce and we'll ship that out right away and it's a nice way for you know people in Phuket during COVID to get fresh vegetables. Um, we sell a lot of our produce at the hotel and we package it specifically for our guests knowing that they're going to be getting on a plane and going back to Bangkok or driving back to Chiang Mai. Um, we have sent produce in the past down to the markets in Bangkok. Again, we support our staff canteen, and if, if anything's left over, it goes for local sale. Um, and we also have a small commercial operation. Uh, we have been protecting the land for 20 years as a chemical-free organic estate. So there's a big demand, especially from essential oil producers, to have organic chemical-free product for their high-end essential oils. Uh, we produce Long Long, which is a vining tree that needs to be grown in a forest. Um, and these take seven years to grow before we can start harvesting the flowers. We do geranium, black mint, and a few other things that people come to us to do. So we have a lot of commercial partnerships um, benefiting from our organic estate. Um, 15 years ago, I opened the Four Seasons Tented Camp in the Golden Triangle of Thailand uh, as a general manager. And we started off with a small vegetable patch behind the kitchen. Um, this was a pretty remote place 15 years ago, uh, there in the heart of the Golden Triangle. Um, and guests enjoyed it so much, we, we soon decided to expand the farm. And with six elephants to feed, we had no trouble in a few months clearing this big 3,500 square meter valley. Uh, once the elephants had cleared it, we built a function, function lawn out there. We put a fish pond in. We planted substantial fruit orchards, as well as creating a cooking school sala. And this whole organic farm became a, a large part of the guest experience um, 15 years ago. And this picture, you know, was taken recently. So, that, you know, the farm is still functioning up there. And then I opened the Siam Hotel as general manager. And this is an inner city hotel, you know, in the, in the old part of Bangkok, where you can see, you know, space is at a premium. We, we really filled up that block but we still managed to find a place to plant a small organic farm. You can see the bit uh, outlined in, in yellow. And we made a small farm. It, it wasn't producing everything in the hotel, but it produced enough that the guests could go down there before cooking class and pick a few things for um, their cooking school. We could use herbs and spices uh, in, our, in our recipes. And we actually also made this part of our, 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 our guest amenity program. There's one part of our, our vegetable patch there covered in a black tarp. And our most frequent guest who spent 50 days a year at the hotel from Texas had his own species of Thai chili he liked. So we, we, we planted him his own chilies. And every time he came to the hotel, he always had his own chilies. And it was very nice, you know, return guest amenity for somebody who really had everything. So Bensley Collection Chintamani Wild is a luxury tented camp we opened uh, about a year and a half ago in southern Cambodia. Uh, it's an 800 acre private nature sanctuary sitting within a 4 million acre national park. Um, and from the beginning, you know, local cuisine, foraging with our naturalists and our chefs was a big part of the guest experience. Um, and now during the COVID closure, we, we decided to expand um, our local produce offering by building a substantial farming operation on our property. Um, we've put in a chicken farm to produce eggs. Uh, we put in a beautiful cocktail garden as well, where we're producing ingredients that can be used for making shrubs and other ingredients to grow into our cocktails. And, and cocktails are a big part of the experience at Bensley Collection. Um, and then we have a big vegetable patch as well. And this combined with our foraging program and working with our neighboring farms allows us to hopefully produce most of the produce that the hotel will need for its operation, as well as supporting our staff village, which is, you know, doing, you know, uh, over 350 meals a day just for the staff. And this is Shintamani in Siem Reap, where we have three hotels. And this is our new plan for our updated organic farm permaculture garden um, um, up at Shintamani uh, on the boundaries of Angkor Wat. And you know, we developed this so it can supply our restaurants, but it can also be a, a core guest experience um, for people staying in Chintamani. 
So Bill Bensley's designed this beautiful sala for us that can act as a cooking school. It can have, act as an event space. And we found a way to make our organic farm uh, one of the main events of the hotel. And then in Rosewood Luam Prabang, uh, we designed the farm and the farm experience into the hotel long before we opened the place. Um, we have substantial gardens and farms throughout the property, even producing our own flowers for our flower arrangements. Um, and the idea behind our, our F&B experience there was that there was gonna be a limited print, printed menu and the chef was gonna go out every day to see what our farmers were harvesting, to see what our neighbors' farms were harvesting, to see what was available in the local markets and then develop menus based on that. Um, and, and this philosophy was part of what got Rosewood Luang Prabang to be ranked as Condé Nast Traveler's number one hotel in Asia uh, this past year. Um, so this is, you know, we don't look at farms as an afterthought. We look at farms as something that need to be designed into the hotel. Um, we all have very, very high expectations for what our farms should be, uh, with oftentimes not realizing how much time, effort, and planning and maintenance goes into meeting that expectation for a farm. So oftentimes the reality of our farms is a little bit different from our expectation. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, is share with you as a hotel general manager, as a hotel developer, some things I've learned along the way that have allowed us to make our farms closer to the expectation and to make, well, to make that reality closer to the expectation. Firstly, and, and, and almost most importantly, is having buy-in from the owner, from the general manager, from the chef, from the finance, from everybody involved with the farm. If people are assigned to it and they think of it as, as a duty or a responsibility or as just part of their job description, um, this is how you tend to get your farms not to meet your expectation. You know, farms have to be a passionate part of your job and, and why we're running these hotels. You know, it's important to make the farms look pretty. You know, treat it like, like a real guest public space, as a design part of the hotel. Um, that allows you to be proud of it when you bring guests there, and it allows it to be more of a revenue-generating area for you. You can have cooking schools within there. You can do events in the, in, in the farm. Um, it's a great kids club activity to get kids out of the kids club room, away from screens and out into the garden. We must all remember that most of the guests that come to our hotels probably don't see a farm on a regular basis. So this is actually a really exciting thing for them. I've seen this for 20 years. Um, it's important to have a plan you know, grow what you need and grow on a cycle. You're never going to be able to grow everything, right? So grow the hero items, the stuff that's really interesting for guests, and then work with your neighbors to grow the rest, right? And, you know, at a minimum, grow organic. There's no need for the use of, you know, inorganic chemical fertilizers and pesticides. By embracing permaculture techniques, you can have a, have a garden that is beyond basic organic, but that's the next step up. You know, employ a full-time farmer. Don't let your chef be responsible for the maintenance of the garden. He should be part of the planning of it and, the, and, and harvesting from it, but have a professional farmer, you know, work in that garden. Work with a permaculture consultant to advise the, and train that farmer how to grow a hotel garden. You know, growing a garden for a hotel is very different than growing a garden to produce produce for the market. You know, it's never great when you have tomatoes in April, 500 kilos of them, and then you never see tomatoes again, right? You want to be growing stuff on a cycle so it's regularly producing for your restaurant. And that's where a good permaculture consultant comes in handy. And think about farming items that can be packaged and sold to guests or other hotels. At Puchai Sai, we produce a lot of basil and we make a lot of pesto sauce. And that pesto sauce is, is canned at the hotel. We sell it to guests. We use it throughout our operation. This can be done with tomatoes and many other things you're producing. And it also provides another revenue stream and a nice thing that the guests can take home with them that's packaged from the hotel. Theme gardens are a lot of fun. 
you know, Shintamani Wild, we're doing a, you know, quite a substantial cocktail garden. You know, we want to be able to produce ingredients for more than just a bit of garnish. We want to be able to produce ingredients that are, you know, a main element of a cocktail. Uh, Puchai Sai, we've developed uh, recipe gardens around our main restaurant. Um, guests can actually go to, you know, the green curry garden and see all the different spices that go into a green curry. It's really interesting for people to see the plants that are producing the spices that go into their food. During our cooking schools, guests can go to those different recipe gardens and actually harvest themselves the herbs and spices that they're gonna use in the dishes they're cooking in that cooking class that day. At Rosewood, we Bill Bensley has designed for us a beautiful spa garden. Surrounding the whole spa area are gardens producing all of the different herbs and spices we use in different spa treatments. And guests will go out into the garden with their spa therapist prior to the treatment to actually select the different ingredients that might go into a poultice used later in that day. Um, we have product gardens at Puchai Sai where you know, we're producing chamomile for tea, we're producing you know, tea for tea. We do all sorts of different things at Puchai Sai that we can do for packaging, such as tomato sugi or, or a nice pesto sauce. And then of course, having parts of your garden to be used for your staff. Supplementing your staff canteen with produce you make yourself will keep your costs down, as well as it gives the staff a greater sense of buy-in to what you're doing on the property because they get to share what the guests get to do and gets, guests get to have. And farm to table, you know, when you're having a farm at your hotel, everything doesn't have to come from your own farm, right? You can work with other farms. You know, work with local farmers around the hotel and get them to grow certain items for you. Supply them seeds and training and commit to buying their produce. Create a little market for them. Get the buy-in from that local community. You grow the hero items on your small farm on the property and your neighbor's farms are growing the other stuff you need. That's all part of the farm to table uh, commitment and ethos. You know, encourage local farmers and foragers to stop by the hotel before they go to the market in the morning. You know, let them, so the chef can pick the produce before it goes to the market. This can be a really nice experience for the guests in the morning to be at that back entrance of the hotel, watching all this fresh produce come out of the mountains and the hillside, you know, if that's available to you. You know, encourage your chef and guests to go out to the local markets and to your neighbor's farms to see what can be found. It's a whole nother guest activity and it makes food that much more enjoyable. 20 years ago at Amman in Bali, it was really cool for the guests that we flew in tomatoes from New Zealand or brought you know, broccoli in from, you know, from America. People, the luxury travelers, they don't care about that anymore. They really care about eating local. It means more to a traveler today at a luxury level to know that their spinach came from the property or from the next door neighbor than to know it came off of a plane. And think about basing your specials on what's found fresh locally, not what's about to go off in your larder. And let this be part of the selling point of your, of your restaurant. Even if your restaurant isn't a fully farm to table commitment, the specials can be. And finally, the final thing I wanna talk about is the importance of finance to farm to table success in a hotel. Finance really is the key to making this work. Firstly, set the farm up as a profit center, right? Manage your expenses and sell your produce back to the restaurant, back to the hotel itself, right? There'll still be a savings in using traditional suppliers. And this way, the farm is not gonna be the first thing that the GM shuts down if they're not making budget that month. This shouldn't be considered an expenditure. This should be considered an important part of the hotel. You know, treat the farm and the farmers and foragers as a serious part of your business. Make it easy for the farmers and the foragers to do invoicing. Oftentimes in a hotel, we are unable to work with local farmers and foragers because they don't have receipt books. They don't issue invoices. They don't get invoices at the markets. And a hand scrolled account on a piece of paper doesn't work for your accountants and the accountants end up killing the project. So keep a big invoicing book at the receiving area with a stamp. And you know, a farmer gets one copy of the invoice that you write for him, the accountant gets the others and is signed by the chef in receiving. Done, make it easy for everybody to make this work. And then most importantly, always pay fair prices to local farmers and foragers. 
don't always try to haggle them down and get the absolute best price. Most of the farmers out there, you know, are not rich people. So make, let them benefit from the operations of our hotel and their hard work. Thank you. Jason, awesome. Thank you very much, Jason Freeman. Um, thank you. We're gonna, we're gonna move on to, to Drew, to Drew Anderson and Ken Hawkins. Um, guys, uh, um, get, uh, uh, Drew and Ken are from Topo Design Studios, and they're gonna show us a case study on the new South Farm Panglao, which is in Bohol in the Philippines. Drew and Ken, please. Cheers, thanks. Can you hear me okay, David? Very clearly, thank you. All right, thanks. And thanks, Jason. Great work. Love what you're doing. And, and you've got some excellent points there at the end too. GMs or GMs' wives are always the one who kill a lot of these projects. <laughs> so look out for them or then the farmer disappears. But listen, today I want to talk to you about an exciting project that we've been uh, working on. And it's in Pang Lao. It's called uh, South <laughs> So South Farm, the concept to reality, finding positives in a COVID crisis. So how did this start? Well, it started, it was fueled by a concept to develop uh, an integrated agriculture into a resort called South Farms. Um, it was meant to be something that guests could experience and engage with agriculture within the landscape, uh, the resort landscape. And, and I don't mean ducks and sheep running around the resort. No, I'm, what I mean is, is more guests overlooking an active agricultural field, um, looking into something which is producing fresh produce that they'll be having for dinner that night. So this integration includes, of course, you know, active walking trails, encouraging guests to engage with the culture and the landscape. And, you know, we've got one positive, big positive here too, is our client actually comes from an agricultural heritage themselves. Um, so they, they have and they manage their own farms. So this led to, throughout this development, this led to a much greater desire for them to want to do more. And so the place expanded and we, we started looking at um, what else can we do? So we developed this very quickly into an organic farm with fruit, vegetables, honey, dairy, and products, all for the consumption of South Palm, as well as their other resort, North Sand, and potential um, on sale to retail. And then this soon led to uh, also sending back the waste to the farm. We need something to uh, pr you know, produce all of our organic matter that we need as well. So it became a very much a centre of all the clients' uh, activities in Bohol, and it became also a destination in its own right. So South Farm developed into something which was a nature-based family tourism destination, something that we were building by, by hand using recycled materials, somewhere with, where markets and events and festivals could be held. Um, both seasonally, annually, where school camps or a rustic camp can, can come and experience with the farm. Guest engagement, of course, with the production, activities, education, and we also gave a home to a lot of art, craft and culture. And of course, we were also producing a lot of, uh, lot of the plants that we needed for the resort that we were also developing. So we went to the hills. And, you know, we took our good friends with us and we started to create an organic farm. And all of this was guided by our green thumb, Uncle Ken, the expert, our horticulturalist, who's worked with us for many years. And, you know, obviously also powered by our wonderful clients who really put everything behind all of this. Now, we added lots, lots of fairy friends and animals to the farm. After all, it is a farm. Uh, we also created, as I said, a nursery for growing what we needed. And we got really excited by the whole recycling um, to a point where we even started recycling, you know, old machinery, you know, and we, we would find these fun and colorful machinery and we would upcycle those and create things like kids play equipment um, or, you know, something which is fun and engaging where, where guests can climb on and take a picture 
as well. There's a lot of old derelict houses that we found um, as well. So we, we, rather than see those get destroyed, we recycled a lot of those materials and we're using that to actually build the farm. Through the excavation of digging the, uh, the water retention ponds, we also discovered a lot of um, limestone on the property. So we're using that to actually produce uh, a lot of the pavements, the walls, etc., on the site and also then using that to actually extend into the resorts. So throughout the development of this dedicated team, we also found that um, there was lots of little surprising elements as we searched around Pang Lao. So we found that there was lost forms of art and craft that were searching for an audience. They were looking for a home. And some of these were down to a one person, one, one man, one lady. Uh, th these, these, were, these were processes that have existed within the culture of uh, Bohol and Panglao for a long time, and they were soon to be lost. So we gave, uh, we gave them a home and we brought them to the farm. And you know, Ken was actually there through a lot of this process as well. So he actually helped to find a lot of these. So, I mean, Ken, maybe you just want to introduce some of these people. Yeah, sure, Drew. Um, when I did a site visit, um, one of the things we always do is research the history of the area and the, the culture and the capabilities. Um, there's long traditions of um, salt making, uh, pottery, um, uh, coconut products, um, all sorts of things, but uh, a lot of these things, because it's a fairly poor area, um, have fallen into uh, neglect. Um, so some of the items like uh, we came across bohol salt, which is as asin, asin tibuak. Um, hundreds of years this salt has been produced there and it's uh, done in a very specific way to Panglao and bohol, Tagbilaran uh, and Elba. Um, and during our research, we discovered that uh, there was one fellow still making it and one family. Um, so in researching that, um, we found out that he's having trouble actually finding people to work with him. And uh, so he's starting to, and getting old himself. So he's starting to think that maybe this is the end of the line. So we've talked to him. Hopefully we can uh, continue on that, uh, that history, but also we get a, um, a very specific smoked uh, salt that um, we can champion as uh, as for local content. During that, we also discovered that uh, it's made in pots that you can see there um, now. Um, and again, it's a very specific process to making these pots um, for this um, salt making. So uh, we then discovered that uh, there's just one lady left that is actually making them. Um, and uh, she's not doing it very often because uh, of course she's getting old as well. So uh, the team on the, the farm are now, um, we're going to build a pottery um, and uh, we're training new people to do these, these um, old um, historical things. Um, also in the farm, we're planting uh, a wide variety of species of things. Um, Fruits and trees, um, fruits and uh, vegetables. Um, so we'll be doing some uh, hydroponics um, because we've got uh, several uh, outlets to supply. So we need uh, volume and quantity assurance. Um, so we're doing 350 square meters of uh, hydroponics, but we're also doing bioponics, which is an organic style of uh, hydroponic growing um, using uh, compost teas and um, uh, kelp and uh, assorted things that we can make on site from waste materials. Um, and uh, aquaponics, the, um, the clients have got a, a very extensive background in that. So we'll, we'll, but we'll be doing a showcase of backyard um, aquaponics so that uh, locals can be inspired to actually get involved and do their own thing as well. Um, 
We're also doing utility plants like uh, Abaca, which is a, um, uh, a local banana uh, plant that uh, local weavers um, use uh, vetiver grass, again, for weaving. Um, there's a local pandanus that um, uh, makes very high quality woven products. So again, we're planting these. We've got pockets of forest. We've got uh, some fields. We've put in a nice big dam so we've got good quality water. Um, and a whole variety of, um, of enterprises that will be centred on the, on the farm and then eventually extended out into the wider community. So uh, I might hand it back to you now, Drew. Yeah, so I mean, what I love about this is that the, we've actually started to create a home for a lot of these wonderful cultural events and, and, and you know, it's something that will be passed on. But of course, in the middle of all this, we've all been hit with what we know now as COVID. So, you know, our clients stood up and said, well, we're going to fight and we're going to keep our staff active and engaged. So from recycling products to create the farm, we then started recycling resort stuff to go and build the farm. So we started up, you know, giving them new skills. So meet Rebel, you know, he was the restaurant supervisor. He's now a wood artist, you know, meet Shamar. Uh, room attendant now tending to the farms. You know, meet Antonio. He, he was do is a lifeguard, and now he's a carpenter and he's a welder. You know, and he's recycling and creating all of these wonderful products. And the rest of the staff are learning how to paint to, and add a bit of colour and a bit of fun. And we've of course, you know, brought in some other furry family friends, and we're already rec uh, seeing some of our first visitors to the farm. So all of this, of course, is really positive for the resort staff because they're actively engaged with what they are going to be using within their resort. They have a, a true sense of ownership. So it started as a vision and a wonderful client and design. And when you put it all together, then you end up with something which is South Farm. So it's not the end, it's just the beginning. So stay tuned. Drew, Ken, thank you. Fascinating um, and, and insights also into, into how to uh, how to recycle people um, post COVID. So that's so that's absolutely great. Thank you. Um, Jeff Smith is up next from uh, Six Senses Hotels, Resorts and Spas. Um, Jeff heads up the sustainability efforts and is going to give us some some insights from Six Senses. Jeff, please. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, everyone. Pleasure to be here today. So. Um, Give me one sec while I try to make this click. There we go. Really quick introduction to our brand for anyone who's not familiar with Six Senses. Uh, we do hotels, resorts, and spas. As you can see on the screen, we've been traditionally a, a very Asia-centric brand, but we've got, uh, we're moving into Europe and, and the Americas as well. Um, as David has mentioned, my role is VP of Sustainability, so I'm heading up sustainability with the group. Um, we are in the luxury category, so, um, uh, we do deliver, you know, luxury experiences to our guests, but we're also very focused on wellness and sustainability. So definitely farm to table and the concept uh, is big for us. And we really try to take it as, as far as we can in the way that we deliver, um, you know, the experiences that we do for our guests. I guess it all starts with landscaping and what's built into our landscaping standards within our brands. And of course, um, you know, we are the brand. We don't, um, we, we, we advise the design process, uh, but we're, we're not the consulting team. So we issue standards and there's, there's elements in those standards that cover things like permaculture design principles. We, we want to have landscapes that are zero chemical or as close to that as we can and really working with nature, um, which means careful plant selection. If we can, we want our landscaping spaces to provide habitat for the local flora and fauna. Um, and if it's not habitat, if it's not providing that role, we really do think of these spaces for their production value throughout the entire property. Um, I think it's also important to touch on waste management. And I think some of my fellow panelists have already done that in a good way. Uh, so it, it really starts with how do we use the materials that we have and our gardens and our farms really play a central role to absorbing those waste materials. And I'll get into that more in a bit. Um, we are big also on upcycling and repurposing materials. So that's in the way that our properties are built. 
Um, and, you know, for example, just repurposing wood or construction materials. We also, we sort out our waste materials and we're really big on upcycling. So making new products from those materials. And for the example on the screen here, these flower pots were made using crushed glass. In some of the locations where we operate, there is no recycling facilities locally for glass for the communities. So we'll keep that material. Um, we like to be very selfish with our materials, our waste materials, and we'll use it to make things. So for example, a flower pot. Um, or when it comes to food waste or landscaping waste, we don't think of that as waste at all. It's fuel for our gardens. So we have composting at all of our locations. And then of course the composting goes back into the gardens. Um, we also make EM, so effective microorganisms from leftover food waste. So we put them in a bucket with some sugar and water, let it rot basically in a controlled kind of way. And we use this as a cleaning material. It's great for floors and drains. Um, we also use it in our gardens to give uh, good microbial health back to the soil. Um, and then of course the gardens. So all six senses have an organic garden. It's kind of a brand standard for us to have that. And we use the gardens in our programming with our guests, which I'll, I'll get into a little more in, in a minute. Um, really we're trying to take the concept outside of the gardens though and what we're encouraging our landscape consultants to do now is to think of all of the all of the space around our resorts for production value if it's not habitat as i've as i've mentioned so an example here is from six senses yao noi in thailand also six senses lamu in the maldives we're using our coconuts so we have coconut trees they make coconuts we don't see them as a waste material we'll use them right so we we actually use them to make coconut oil and that's a workshop that guests can get involved in. They can learn how we make the coconut oil and they can take some home as a souvenir, which is fun. Um, also in the Maldives, they're making coconut palm sugar. And this is um, kind of riffing on uh, Drew and Ken's presentation, local artists and local skills, um, a similar story. We discovered this is kind of a, an art that's being lost in the local islands where we operate in the Maldives of making sugar from their, from their palms, from the coconut palm. So we've, we've tried to kind of revitalize this technique and we're, we're making it on site. And again, guests can learn about it and take some home with them, which is fun. Over in Oman, we have date palms throughout the properties. And this is, these are definitely not in the gardens. They're lining the paths and the roads, the bike paths around the resort. And once a year, we make a big deal out of our date festival. So, um, and there's a lot more, there's a lot that goes into it, but we have to pollinate the dates and we actually have date specialists specialists who take care of this, but we make lots of products from it. We make uh, jams, date vinegar, um, and uh, what we can't eat and we share with the local community uh, and with the, the local goats that live in the village <laughs> next door. Uh, charcoal, so if you know branches fall from trees, we use those too and we make our, we make our own charcoal from you know, what otherwise would be uh, described as wood waste. We try to upcycle that. And we even take it so far, our property in Samui, Thailand, we make wood vinegar from this too. So we actually produce charcoal and then we distill the smoke into a wood vinegar and we use that in our landscaping. So it kind of comes full circle. Um, the way, same way composting comes first full circle back to fuel the gardens. We, we can use the charcoal to make the wood vinegar and then we use that in the garden as a natural insecticide to keep insects out as part of our, um, you know, reduced chemical strategy. All of our properties have gardens, as I mentioned. Uh, the, the example here on the screen is from Qingcheng Mountain in China. Um, we like to bring guests into the gardens. We do definitely think of the gardens as a front of house space. Absolutely, they're designed with that in mind. Um, we use them not only for our kitchens, but also for, for use in our spa. Uh, and also landscaping, as I've described in, you know, just previously that example, anything that we can use for production. We, and we actually track one of our KPIs for our hotels is the production value of their gardens. Uh, what are, how much are they producing from the gardens? Uh, we do lots of like, you know, the classic farm to table with the chef and the guests in the garden, you know, collecting food or herbs and then doing like a cooking class. We like to do cooking classes right there in the garden. We use these spaces for events. We might do cocktails in the gardens. Um, we also produce other products that, as I mentioned, our kind of delivery for, for food and beverage, a big focus on is what we call eat with six senses. So this is like um, some standardized programming that talks about natural ingredients. We want to see on our menus what comes out of the garden. Um, there's a lot of sustainability and, and purchasing policy built into this too. Grow with Six Senses is what we call our kids clubs. 
Uh, so we definitely bring the kids into the gardens. This is a big element of how we deliver our kids club programming. So, you know, learning about where plants come from, getting into the nursery, growing from seeds, um, getting them involved there. We have a dedicated space at all of our, all of our hotels that we call Earth Lab. Uh, and it's a space for engagement around what we do on sustainability. So this is a space for anything from the gardens. All of our garden production will come through the Earth Lab. This is where we weigh it, process it, and then send it out to the food and beverage, to the spa, back to landscaping. Um, this is how we track the metrics and we display those metrics. So this is also where we talk about all of our energy, water, and waste, and how we're managing those for the guests during their stay. And we do workshops in the Earth Lab. So guests can learn about how you know, we make um, hydrosols or essential oils from the, the produce coming out of the gardens. Or maybe we dry them and store the herbs uh, we collect seeds. We, our aim is to not have to purchase any seeds, although of course we still do, um, but we'll, we'll allocate certain plants in the garden to go to seed so that we can collect the seeds and we store them in the earth lab and we have a seed bank. Guests can take seeds home if they want or, and again, we use those in the kids club and they grow from seed and that's always fun. Um, some more kind of design elements that we put into our hotels. So a few of them now are going a bit farther and they'll actually have an offsite farm location, but we'll have something like what we're seeing here, a farmhouse. And this is Six Senses Krabby Island in Cambodia, where we'll make like a, a big deal of like going on an offsite visit to the farm. And that's where we'll have a bit more of a, you know, like the, like the example here, a, a, a built structure where we can do a really nice cooking class and farm to table meal right at the farm. Um, we also do mushrooms. So we grow our own mushrooms at lots of our properties. This is the inside of one of our mushroom huts um, where we grow those. So we, we typically will purchase the like packed bags with spores already done. Um, and we just, we grow them in the hut and we, we harvest them ourselves, of course. Uh, we like to do worm villas. So that's kind of a fun design element. So it's, it's worm composting, but you know, we just kind of call it a worm villa, which is, uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a show, um, but it's also fun. And it, there's an educational element to this too. So we do tours, we do educational tours of our farms and we would show them the mushroom hut, show them our composting, show them where we sort the waste and what we do with waste. Um, and of course the worm villa would be a stop on the tour and we'd talk about worm composting if we have that in that location. Uh, we do bug hotels and that's fun. And coming back to what I mentioned earlier about permaculture and working with nature, uh, we don't wanna kill all of our insects. We actually want some species of insects. There are desirable species. So we'll create that habitat for them um, targeting desirable species. And again, we, you know, we want to make it fun and showcase it for the guests in a very front of house kind of way. So we'll call it the bug hotel. And here's an example. Um, this is from Duro Valley in Portugal, but we do this in our Asian properties as well. Um, irrigation and, and water efficiency. I thought it would be important just to mention that. And that's a design consideration. Of course, uh, we also try to use gray water in any, any chance we can. Some of our places also harvest rainwater, but I think gray water does a much better job because gray water you have year round, rainwater you only have in the rainy season, you don't necessarily need it then. Um, and we do livestock too. So we've got ducks, we've got chickens, we've got goats. Uh, we do quite a bit of beekeeping. Um, the chickens are great because they can eat scraps from the kitchen. The goats are great because they'll eat anything. Uh, so they tend to eat a lot of our landscaping waste. So branches, you know, we trim the hedges and we feed it to the goats and then they're fun and the kids can play with them. And bees are great for many reasons, but you know, who doesn't like fresh honey? We've also got, you know, we're going, we're going kind of crazy with livestock. Some of our properties now have cows, we have camels, um, and we have, we have, we actually try to refer to third party standards and guidelines on humane practice and standards of care for those, just so that we're making sure we're giving them the best um, care that we possibly can. All of our chickens are free range, um, and we actually invite guests to visit the livestock, of course, right? So again, making a very front of house. Uh, some of our properties with chickens will actually give the guests a basket, like a little basket that they can bring down and collect the eggs and bring it right to the, right to the kitchen and it's cooked for them. So it's fresh, um, organic, you know, one day old eggs. Um, and it kind of blows people's minds to taste those eggs for the first time. Um, and then we do a little bit of cheese too. Um, which is kind of just, you know, getting to the end of my slides. But um, of course, if we have the goats or the cows, then we'll, we'll do cheese production. Um, I already mentioned some of the other things we make, but we do work with, um, you know, local artists too. We'll bring them in and invite them in to do, you know, arts and crafts and local producers. And we try to give them kind of uh, access to our guests for, as a market. Um, so we purchase directly from them and we want to give them access to our guests. 
Um, it's, I, I think it's important to mention that we, we try, and I'm sure every, this is something that's in part of everyone's decision making is, you know, we want to work with local farmers. So it's a, it's a tricky balance of not competing against them. Uh, so one of the ways around that is we do try to select a lot of like, you know, microgreens or fresh salad greens that aren't usually, you know, a main staple for the local farmers anyways. Um, we, you know, and there's always a balance of doing that well, where we still want to support local farmers, but we also want to shrink our supply chains as much as we, much as we can and produce our own and have that showcase for our guests. Um, we do some aquaponics, I forgot to mention. And, um, and I also, I just, just uh, again mentioned, you know, Drew and Ken mentioned this during COVID and everyone's shut down right now. Yeah, we've also got, we've made a big shift to our gardens. So we've got, we've got our, you know, some of our staff hanging around the hotels and everybody into the garden. Let's see what we can produce. It's great for team building. We use our gardens for team building and training anyways, but during a time like this, it's, it's even more important to kind of keep people active and, you know, reconnect with, with nature and, and food through the gardens, which is what we do for guests. And we do it for our staff and our, ourselves as well. Jeff, thank you. Wow. So much information. Um, uh, thanks very much for, for all of that. These slides, by the way, they're, they're going to be they're going to be available for download. As a, as I've been asked a lot of questions as this has been going along, are these slides going to be going to be available within about an hour? There'll be a recording. There'll be and there'll be there'll be some slides that you can um, you can take away and, and study a little bit more. Um, we're now going to turn to um, uh, somebody else, James Noble. Well, James Noble comes at this from a slightly different tack. Um, James, the chef, um, came to Thailand as a chef, and he's moved out of the kitchen and into the farm designing um designing farms boutique farms and he's currently co-founder of an 800 rye farm called origin the boutique farm in chiang mai um james are you with us i am and not only am i with you david i'm in a great company gentlemen i didn't realize there were so many of us out there which makes me feel proud Excellent, excellent, James. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Origin, the boutique farm. Um, uh, you know, because because you you basically put it together from from nothing, from what I from what I understand. Um, just tell us a little bit about that process um, uh, and some of the decisions that you've made as a as a chef coming at it from a slightly different perspective. Sure, Orig Origin Farm is a joint venture with the Banyan Tree Group, and they approach me in my small restaurant farm in Hoi Hien in Thailand and asked me if we could do something together on the same lines of what we're doing, what we were doing currently, um, but with the chef involved as opposed to uh, making a farm for a specific resort. So what we did um, as origins, we decided that we would generate a farm that would be available to every chef in Thailand. So hotels and small restaurants can rent space on our farm. So in theory, have their own farm without getting themselves dirty, sweaty, hot and bothered. Okay, which, which we do on a daily basis. So what this then does, it enables chefs to grow specific products for their specific outlets. So whether you're a Michelin restaurant in Bangkok or a street food vendor that can't get a supply of a specific uh, historical product that's been outdated and not grown anymore you can approach origins and origins will um, grow that specific product on your behalf uh, for a set price okay you got okay that? and and yeah I, I, absolutely tell us a little bit about, about the scale of the farm so the farm is so, so you've got 800 rye of tunnels that uh that, that chefs rent on the on the farm or is yeah. it a, a, so what, what's the what's the um uh, uh overview of it okay so so the property is vast and it has different climates through mountain ranges different different soil types through low and flat land we have different types of growing controlled environments uh hydroponic environments natural traditional growing methods um, so if you wanted a specific item, say, for instance, that is from another country, say it's from India and a specific chili, we would then go and research that chili, find that seed, and then create an environment to, create, to grow that imported product within Thailand. So it then becomes indigenous as opposed to unindigenous. So what that does then is you then completely cut out your air miles. Your air miles 
let's be honest, I'm a chef. There's lots of prima donnas around. Uh, and we didn't really care about where the ingredients came from because we would just mark it up accordingly. So if you wanted a specific product flown from Brazil, then you will have a specific product grown from Brazil. If you wanted a product that was out of season, it can be in season because you have the world at your doorstep. And what we're saying now is, let us grow that for you. Let us become your farmer. Let us offer you space and advice on the products that you want. And then change your menu accordingly every three months to your space. So you can change in 90 days notice, we can change your tunnel from A to B to C product uh, within 90 days. So is this what you mean by, by the concept um, sustainable, sustainable retained farming? Retained farming is we become your farmer. So obviously a lot of, a lot of properties don't have the luxury of the properties that, that we've discussed today. So if you're an urban city resort or a, or, or a five-star hotel on Sukhumvit Road, then we, you can then have your own farm. We, it's just managed by us. So we get the chef involved, we get the, the chef engaged. As Jason said, you just need to get the owner um, and the GM on board. And once they're on board, the PR, PR and marketing value, the transparency of the journey of the product becomes really, really worthwhile. Not only that, the price is, becomes a fixed cost. So if you're renting a certain amount of space, your food, food cost becomes fixed as opposed to variable. So you know from your specific amount of space, you are going to harvest a, a specific weight of product. Then you can control your cost a whole lot better. So it's not really indigenous products that, that, you're, that you're farming, it's mainly non-indigenous products. Non-indigenous, because this is where the damage is done, David. People are flying things in to create menus. You import a chef, he only knows a specific product. He only knows a different strand of tomato or uh, a specific you know, herb or spice. Now this can be grown if you then create the environment. However, we will not create an environment that grows products um, in an unethical way. Mm -hmm. So the banyan tree and myself would not air condition the room to grow rhubarb. Rhubarb doesn't grow in Thailand. We shouldn't be using rhubarb in Thailand. There's many options. So what we'll do is we'll advise chefs, GMs, alternative products. Mm. And um, uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting. What are some of the more unusual requests that you've had over the, over the years? Because I know you've, you, this is not your first farm, but I mean... Um, uh, no, this what, is not my first rodeo, David. I've heard, I've, heard quite a few, <laughs> I've heard quite a few people ask for some weird and wonderfuls. And, and most things can be achieved, but as long as it, it's low carbon, as long as it's not damaging to the environment, we'll give it a go. So when, when chefs ask for a rentable space, we then also, free of charge, offer um, R&D, research and development space, free of charge, so we can play with things. Um, and once we're playing with things for them and creating options for them, there's no cost involved. Right. Um, can, can, um, uh, drop a few names for us, James, if you will. Um, um, uh, some of the some of the restaurants, um, uh, levels of restaurants, types of restaurants. Um, that well, you're, that you're supplying other than hotels. Sure, sure. Well, well, in, in and out we, hotels. We, we supply all, all of the Banyan Tree Group because we work with the Banyan Tree hand in hand, and and their yep. ethics. And their ethics and, and, and ethos and, and mission and mantras are fantastic. They, 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 they fit with ours completely. So we supply specific items for the Banyan Tree Group all the way down to Krabi, uh, Phuket, um, and then future, future options uh, up here north in Chiang Mai and the likes. Then we, offer, then we supply certain restaurant and certain names in, in, in Bangkok from the Suring Brothers to Paste um, with Kun B to Chef uh, Chompon in Ahan. Um, that we offer the uh, Grand Erawan, we supply those, um, the new restaurant Igniv. And in total, I'm still very, very well connected with obviously culinary because we are carrying 14 Michelin stars on our farm. Right. So we have, a Michelin star, we have a Michelin starred farm. Get that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, just quickly, a couple, couple of other things. Um, um, I understand you are going to be putting a restaurant on the farm too. What, how, how, how is that playing out? Yeah, we can't, we can't, it's, it's, 
I've seen some slides today of everybody's failures and I and, 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 and gosh I've had more than most I think um, building building properties on farmland is very difficult because of, of, of the soil it's very soft you have to you have to build within the environment as opposed to you know uh, a design that somebody's given you who's never set foot on a farm so we're doing a, a pop-up restaurant for a couple of years in Chiang Mai itself called waiting for May uh, this is quite personal to me my wife is Kun May um, and I wait for her every single day to bring products to the restaurant so there could be an expletive waiting for beep May because sometimes she's late but then as farmers we're also waiting for May in Thailand because it's the start of the rainy season so we're always, as farmers, looking for May to see how the heavy the rain's going to be, how much water we can save for the following dry season. And then we have a change of cycle of crops from underground crops to overground green crops, May onwards. So yeah, yeah the restaurant's yeah, yeah. fantastic. And the restaurant is a complete white affair. It has absolutely no menu. You come in, you sit down, we give you a piece of blank paper, which is AKA the menu, and you write on that menu your likes, dislikes, and allergies. This goes back to the kitchen, and from there on in, you're in our hands. We then serve you till you tap out and can eat no more. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like, sounds Amazing, like fun. I look, I, look, I look forward to my invitation. Um, hey, um, J J James, I've got, I've got yeah. a couple of other quick things, um, because we're running a little bit out of time. Um, just just on, on a bigger picture, um, you've been in Thailand for some time, uh, uh, 10, 10, 10 plus years. Um, uh, but, but in terms of you know, agri-tourism is, is still pretty much in its infancy. What is the potential of agri-tourism in, in Thailand and yeah, in many fantastic. other countries that are tuning in? It's absolutely fantastic. On the farm, obviously, we have 800 rai. And I don't think re people realise how big 800 rai is until you stand in it and then realise that you've left your keys at the other end of it. You know, so it's, it's, it's huge. And to fill that space, we're developing a maze, a maze made out of maize, so a corn maze. Now this is a non-destructive, uh, sustainable tourist attraction where people can come and walk through 200 rye of grown mazes that change every three months. And what we do with the corn that's produced from the maize, we give it to the community who sell it. And then the stems of the corn we give to cattle to feed the cattle of the local community. Agrotourism, especially in today's climate, people need to see where things come from. People need to get dirt between their toes and people need to understand how hard it is to be a farmer. James, thank you very much. And please stick around. We've got a whole bunch of questions that are coming up. I'm going to hand over to Bill, to Bill Barnett. Um, Bill, you've got a, a few closing words for us, please. Uh, certainly, David. You know, yeah, this is an exciting panel for me because you know you guys are great. You know, this is you know these are some of the most innovative sessions out there. I think that's important to what we're trying to achieve. You know, these guys giving their ideas and everything else. It's not a commercial pitch. It's about what's happening in terms of a design rethink, and I think that's really important. You know, in terms of that, I think farm to table hotels, farm to table hotels, farm to fork, plate to plate to plant to plate, whatever we call it. It's an exciting space. Now, let me tell you a story. Uh, I'm actually much younger than I seem in terms of that, but actually, you know, I, I grew up an age before the internet. So it was interesting because there was a limited choice out there. And every morning when I'd go to school, we'd all talk about what we watched on TV the night before. There were three networks and everything else. There was a limited choice, right? I think what happens is, let's look at a club sandwich and a croissant in a hotel, right? Now, anybody who can actually see me understands that I like croissants, right? <laughs> yeah, in terms of that. I'm a man of large girth and certainly I like croissants and a club sandwich after, after a 3 a.m. late drinking night session, going back to a hotel and ordering a club sandwich from room service. It's a good idea. But somehow when we've been looking at projects recently, we're saying, we're doing a new hotel. Do we need club sandwiches? Do we need croissants? Does the menu in a hotel have to be the same if it's in North America? if it's in Hua Hin, if it's in Algeria, does it have to be the same thing? And I think that's where we understand farm to table hotels are cutting and saying everything doesn't have to be the same. Because at the end of the day, I think what's important is that guests treat, hotels treat their guests like idiots. Because at the end of the day, you know, do you honestly have to have the same menu in every hotel you go into? Do you need a Nasi Goreng? Do you have to have that croissant everywhere you go? I can make a decision. Maybe I want something different. I don't want to be treated the same way. 
you know, hotels have become food factories, you know, and that's at, at the end of the day, it's mass produced. It's out of touch with the food that sells, you know. In hotels, you're surrounded by idiots because they think that you can't think for yourselves. That's why people leave hotels and go out to eat in restaurants because they want something different. They want an idea. They want something to say, what's fresh? What's there now? They don't necessarily need to have that club sandwich because, you know, they always know where to go. If they want it, just go to a Marriott, right? That's fine. It's, you know, it's, it's a nice feeling knowing it's out there. But the other day, for most of us, we'd like to have something different. And I think that's what Farm to Table is exciting because it's saying, what's fresh? What's there? You know, again, where do you, where is your food coming from? And no matter where you're thinking about, you know, should it be coming from here when you look at the screen? That's where your food's coming from at the end of the day. You know, in a hotel, it's mass produced, it's institutional, it's everything that's wrong about food. And that's why when we look at the revolution of farm to table hotels, it's reconnecting food because the food comes from the earth. You know, understanding that process, understanding it doesn't need to be shipped from Chile, it doesn't need to be shipped from France somewhere else. So if you, if you want French food, go to France, okay? You know, at the end of the day, if you want something local or something else, connect to it there. Understand it's come from 300 meters away. You know, understand the story of the food and something else. That's what's important to reconnect to the earth and everything else. That's why farm to table is important because there's a connection of who's growing your food and also seeing it on your plate. I think that's so important. You know, again, I think, you know, when we're talking about looking at local, fresh, seasonal food, right? You know, seasons change. When you go to the weather, you know, seasons change. Why can't food change? Why do I have to have the same menu in a hotel 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, I gotta see the same bloody menu in a hotel, right? That's nonsense, because at the end of the day, you should be able to come out and say, what do I wanna eat, right? What's fresh today? The menu should change, because your cook's not an idiot, because at the end of the day, the hotels treat their staff like idiots too, because staff can think for themselves how to cook and enjoy that process, right? Would they rather cook something different type of menus, different type of specials of the day, not just producing that same bloody club sandwich every day, right? So we gotta get beyond the club sandwich. So I think what we like about farm to table is celebrate food and embrace the change. You know, this is so important because at the end of the day, I think you know, this quote says it all, farming is a profession of hope, right? And what I hope is that our listeners today, when people look at the inspiring talks that you guys are giving out there is, they want to change too, whether it's baby steps, whether it's big steps or whatever else, they understand there's something beyond the simple menu that's been in, in a hotel for 20 years, right? Get out and change it, okay? That's our message today. David, over to you. Thank you. Um, Bill Barnett, straight between the eyes. I certainly wouldn't want to be cooking for you. Um, uh, <laughs> no, if it's not as uh, uh, fresh as um, uh, fresh it comes. Um, just quickly, uh, there's a few questions that have come in. Um, one for you, Jason, um, uh, to start with. You've looked at, you've, you've worked across many, many different hotels. Um, in terms of the amount of produce that's uh, produced on, uh, for the hotel, basically, uh, uh, versus the farm. So you've got, you've got a farm, how much is used for the hotel and how much is um, used for outside? Just roughly, usually within the resorts that you've worked on. Generally, Jason. we end up using we use 95% within the farm. We rarely ever have so much surplus that is going for sale in the market. You know, we have that channel available, but you know, we're, we're finding ways to sell it through ourselves. At Puchai Sai, we, you know, we post an ad on our social media that we have, you know, plum mangoes or we have asparagus or we have something and we get, you know, 60, 70, 80 orders, you know, five, 10 kilos per order all over Thailand, we ship it out. So we're finding ways, you know, to, to, to move the items from the property. Right, Drew, um, uh, in, in, t in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of your farm in, uh, in, in Bahal, how, how, mu how much have you allocated for, for the hotel to be, to be, to be consumed um, with it within, within the hotel and, uh, and what's gonna be used outside? Um, well, Ken's probably better to talk about the volumes that will come out of it. But basically speaking, I mean, we, we are looking to produce uh, everything that we need locally for two resorts, but also, of course, because it's actually a, a tourist destination in itself, um, we're actually using it on the property as well. So, and, and, and all of these properties, are, I mean, one of them is only about 150 metres away, so everything's very local. But in terms of volume, um, sorry, Ken will have to answer that one a bit better than that. <laughs> Ken, over to you. Oh, there you go. Um, <coughs> We're aiming for as much as we can. Um, 
we're not going to be able to do everything there. We were probably realistically about 70% to start with. Um, but we're also looking at using the farm that we're developing as a core for future expansion. So what we want to do is make this uh, basically a community hub. So the goats that we're getting are um, high value Nubian goats, which produce three litres of milk a day. From that, we can use milk. We can also make cheese and things like that. Once we've got that genetic material in the area, we can start breeding goats and getting locals to start growing um, or keeping goats as well. So we're trying to develop new industries in the, in the area as well. So the same thing for coconuts and uh, coconut sugar, and coconut oil. Um, Great. We're using the farm as a, a place of education and contact with the local community. So uh, we're also planting, uh, starting off with about 250 species of plants. We're doing um, spices, we're doing um, uh, fruits, of course, a uh, dozen different types of mangoes rather than just the, the normal mango around. So um, we're looking for variety, but also uh, to get quantity, we're gonna start doing satellite uh, farms as well. So uh, cocoa, uh, coffee, things like that. Fantastic. We've got some other properties with, with, that we can develop. So all of our leafy leafy greens, uh, herbs, yep. um, we'll be able to, and then we'll extend from there. Fantastic. Ken, thank you. Um, James, quality. Um, if you are um, uh, planting and farming for Michelin starred restaurants, the quality needs to be, um, uh, um, it needs to be right up there. Um, how do you maintain it? Uh, unmute please, yeah, unmute please. Oh there yes. Hello. If they specifically ask for a certain amount of a quantity, like 10 kilos a week of a specific tomato, then we would grow over that to make sure that we can then categorize the quality product to them and have an overflow of about five to 10%. And that five or 10%, then we offer them to make sun-dried tomatoes or tomato ketchups from their own product on our farm to be delivered to them at a later date. But consistency and quality, um, if you're growing organically, you'd have to grow 10 to 15% over to allow yourself the quantity that they need at, at the quality they desire. Excellent, thanks James. Um, uh, um, while you're on to urban farms, I, um, if I'm not mistaken, you've done a couple of urban farms, at urban, urban hotels, at urban resorts that have yeah, small no, 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 spaces. The, the, the what, seasons, sort of, the yeah, seasons, what, what, what sort of space do you need um, uh, in an urban environment to have a kind of an urban farm, if you like. I need a, I need a whole lot more space than they're prepared to give. Well, wow. Because, you know, at the end of the day, a bedroom makes more money than a farm, doesn't it? So they'd rather squeeze two more bedrooms into a hotel than put a, a, a space for a farm. So I'm called in at the last minute to say, we've got a bit of space that's normally dark and useless drain, uselessly drained and, um, you know, terrible builders rubble uh, left over from the build. And, and can you make a, a small herb garden or or some sort of a permacultured space um it all depends on what they want what they need we can work around it we can grow vertically we can grow horizontally we can put earth ovens in we can we can put solar ovens in it all depends on what they want but most spaces can be adapted thank you um jeff uh, do you have any 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 uh, um, metrics if you like in terms of uh, how much farmland is required to be able to, to produce enough produce per guest per key. How about that? Uh, Sorry, Jeff. Uh, yeah, well, there's an easy short answer to that is as much as you can get, um, you know, similar to even, not just in urban environments, but even in resorts, uh, you know, it's, it's the revenue per square meter and what's the value of this farm is a question that comes up sometimes. Um, None of our hotels are completely self-sufficient. I'm not sure we really want to be either because, you know, back to my point about supporting local farmers as well. Um, so there is no real answer to that, right? It's, it's, we use the space that we have the best way we can. We want some of that to be habitat for local species. We want some of it to be production value. What we definitely don't want is any wasted space where it's just, you know, beautiful rose bushes that don't produce anything. Right, right. Um, fantastic, thank you. Um, Jason, um, uh, the threats of the environment, climatic threats, um, how, does, how do your farms 
cope with the threats um, that, that faced by traditional farming, of course, being at the mercy of the elements. Jason? Um, you know, we, we, we try not to, you know, add to the problem so we don't, we don't burn our fields, for example. Um, but then if, you know, climatic shifts are so much, we'll just change what we're producing to better suit the environment. Um, as uh, Mr. Noble said, you know, we're not going to air condition a room to produce rhubarb, right? That just adds to the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, got another one for you here, here James. Um, is there no risk involved with introducing foreign plant species to Thailand um, and make them indigenous? Is there a risk um, involved? Yeah, obviously we don't live in Australia, so we're not that stringent. But now we're running, we're running our own seed bank. So, so every, every seed that we now grow from or every product that we can offer comes from an indigenous seed. So that's long past concern now. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, hi Jean, uh, and Drew and Ken. Um, how do you keep the farm hygienic uh, and, and plastic free? Um, well, that's a good question. But I mean, the, <laughs> we, we, well, I don't think we, we're not using plastic on the farm itself. Um, if we, any, any plant, we are, sorry, we are accepting plastic to come to the farm for our recycling center and we want to produce products from that, um, which we can then use. We are recycling or upcycling leftover barrels and containers to create the hydroponics, et cetera. Um, you know, but uh, also, uh, also with the, the production of, um, of produce, HACCP has to be uh, adhered to. Uh, in a resort, you, you get one person getting, uh, you know, a bad stomach, you've got um, public liability insurance and things like that, and your reputation will get um, damaged very quickly as well. So that's why we, we usually incorporate um, some hydroponics, because uh, you've got a lot of quality assurance from that, and you can also um, uh, sequence um, crops out of that very well. Um, but also any produce that goes through has to be uh, washed stringently. Um, all of your water has to be treated. Um, if you're using recycled water, you have to make sure that it's of an AAA quality. Um, there's a whole lot of things you're doing. Also things like uh, food wastes and things, um, we're looking at, uh, well, we are using um, biodigesters to, um, to in part to process that. So. Um, um, from that, you then get a, uh, uh, an acceptable um, fertilizer that you can use on crops and things. Uh, so there's a lot that needs to be done. Also, uh, kitchen set setups. The great thing is resort kitchens uh, already, you know, uh, adhere to these standards. So your produce is cleaned and then it goes into a kitchen and then it is um, prepared um, to stringent standards. Uh, you really don't want to make anyone ill. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ken, excellent. Um, uh, Bill Barnett, a question for you about the club sandwich. Um, it seems to be an area of some, of some controversy. Um, what do you propose you, you replace it with? The club sandwich is a classic. What else are you going to have uh, at 3 a.m. when you get in and you've had a few too many? Ah, well, actually, maybe I should just go to bed, actually. Maybe I just go to sleep and wake up. And, uh, <laughs> either that, actually, probably the better answer is just have an all-nighter. I go, why go to bed at all? You know, I don't know. Anybody who's been locked up for the past two or three months, I can't wait to go on a business trip, and I can't wait to go out. So the answer is don't go to bed. Don't order the club sandwich and keep on drinking. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up there, and I'm going to say thank you so much to everyone. It's been a great session. James Noble, Jason Friedman, Drew Anderson, Ken Hawkins, Jeffrey Smith, Bill Barnett. Thank you so much. This, is gonna, this has been recorded and it will be sent to everyone who's registered. You'll have it within the hour. Thanks a lot. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.